my people. I hope we're doing well. Uh, as promised, uh, some videos on limits and continuity. Um, continuity, as we talked about in class, has to do with, uh, from an Algebra 2 and pre-Cal understanding, basically it has to do with being able to draw a, a graph without picking up your pencil. And like I said, you basically have run into three different types of discontinuity. So continuity was basically defined negatively. <clears throat> when you were dealing with rational functions, you ran into uh, two different types. You ran into the asymptotic discontinuity, uh, and then you, move, then you ran into removable discontinuities, right? And the, and the uh, difference between them was when you're dealing with a rational function, and the, uh, the factor responsible for the discontinuity cancels, it's removable, or what we usually call a whole. Uh, when it doesn't cancel, it winds up giving you an asymptote. Uh, the third type of discontinuity, uh, which is usually associated with piecewise functions, but also uh, greatest integer functions, is the jump discontinuity, right? Uh, and so those are the three that we have. And basically the idea is, you know, if I can draw the function without picking up my pencil, then it's continuous. If I have to pick up my pencil, it is discontinuous at that point. Now, having, having introduced the concept of limits, we're now able to define continuity um, as it pertains to those limits. And basically here, you see the fact that at x is equal, and we'll call this c, and we'll call this c, and we'll call this c, right? Uh, the function, uh, a function f is continuous at c if the following three conditions are met. So if you ever asked about continuity, you need to list which, which aspect it fails if it's discontinuous, uh, you need to list all three of them and confirm the fact that it does actually, uh, it does actually, it is actually confirmed that all three are true if it is continuous. Now f of f of c is defined. Now at an asymptote, it's not defined, right? Basically, this winds up being something like you know a over x minus c. You plug in c, you get a zero in the denominator, and that is what happens here. Now. Here, this winds up being, you know, y is equal to maybe, you know, some, some, something like x plus c over x minus, you know, times x minus c over x minus c, and of course those cancel, giving you the whole, uh, but it still isn't defined there, right? It doesn't exist. Now, here's the thing. On something like this, you can see that the limit exists. So part two is actually satisfied, but on this one and this one, both, the function doesn't exist. Now on this one, the function does exist, right? The function exists right there. But what we have here is the fact that the, that the limit from the right is going to this value. The limit from the left is going to this value. The limit from the left and from the right are not the same, and therefore the limit doesn't exist. Uh, now, I mean, you could go back to this middle one right here and actually have, you know, that point right there. So you, so you could have this other, you could have it where the limit exists because the limit as x approaches c from the left and from the right are both going to this value. You could have it so that the function does exist, it's at this value, but it violates number three and the, the limit and the function value do not, do not have the same value. Okay, so we're going to go through a couple of examples where we're just going to run through all three of these questions so that we get used to sort of that cadence. Okay, now let's look at f of x is equal to 1 over x, which, you know, we should recognize as the reciprocal function. Uh, and we could, and here's the thing, you don't necessarily have to graph it. I'm going to graph it just so that we can see it a little bit better. Uh, and that's, you know, never a bad idea. So uh, what we have here is um, and uh, da, 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 da. so we have here this is the reciprocal function 
okay? Does the function exist everywhere? And the answer is no, okay? The function f of x does not exist at x is equal to zero. So it is discontinuous at zero. But here's the thing, it doesn't, the function doesn't exist everywhere. So therefore it is not continuous everywhere. But is the function continuous on its domain? And the answer is yes. Because at every other point except x is equal to zero, and of course the domain is such that uh, zero is not included, uh, it is continuous everywhere on its domain, even if it is not continuous everywhere, because the discontinuity is also a break in the domain, but that isn't necessarily always the case, right? Uh, just because there is a break in the domain uh, does not mean that there is a discontinuity. Does that make sense? Now, of course, uh, even if there was a value here that you were plugging in, uh, if you did it sort of piecewise and you sort of gave f of x a value at zero, the limit doesn't exist because as I'm approaching from the right hand side, it is going to positive infinity. So the limit as x approaches zero from the right of f of x is going to positive infinity. The limit as x approaches zero from the left of x, f of x is going to negative infinity. So therefore the limit doesn't exist. So the function doesn't exist, the limit doesn't exist, and of course, both of those have to exist to even answer part three. Uh, but basically, you, you don't have to give all of that information. You basically simply have to say, uh, the function is discontinuous at x is equal to zero because the function doesn't exist at x is equal to zero. And done. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this next function, g of x. Now, g of x, we remember the fact that this should uh, simplify to x plus 1. But remember that we have to include, uh, we have to include this right here because what was, what was disallowed because of the form of the function here, uh, part of the implied domain, what was implied here needs to be explicitly stated here. So what happens here is this winds up being, and let's go ahead and scale it the same way that we did before, every two boxes being one unit. Um, what happens here is this is x plus one. Uh, so we have this right here, but you notice that this is a hole right here. Okay. Now, does the function exist everywhere? No, okay. The function f of x does, or g of x, sorry, g of x does not exist at x is equal to one. And the thing is that you don't even have to go on to the next question, but let's go ahead and just entertain it. Now, does the limit of the function exist everywhere? And the answer is yes. Because even though the function value doesn't exist here, as you approach from as you approach x is equal to one from the left and from the right, it's actually going to a location even if that location doesn't exist. Um, and of course, both of them have to exist in order to in order to even entertain question number three. Um, let's go ahead and move on to a third example, and we have uh, h of x is equal to x plus one. Uh, for x is less than or equal to zero, and x squared plus one for x is greater than zero. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do a little graphing. For greater than zero, uh, it's going to be a whole because it's non-inclusive, and then over one and up one, and over two and up four, right? And so this is the right hand side, the x squared plus one. Now the x plus one winds up uh, 
going along like this and but at x is equal to zero it actually meets the other one and fills that hole okay so does the function exist everywhere and the answer is yes there is no there is no input value for which the output there is not an actual value and so the function does exist there okay and at h of zero it's one does the limit of the function exist everywhere? And the answer is yes, because the limit from the limit from the um, the left hand side uh, as x approaches zero is going to one. The limit from the right hand side as x approaches zero is going to one. So the limit as x approaches zero of h of x is equal to one. And are the limit and the function value the same? Yes, they are. Okay, so you have h of 0 is equal to 1, which is also equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of uh, h of x. So yes, so yes, 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 and therefore the function is continuous at that value. And in fact, every value, right? There are no discontinuities for this function because basically you, they, they, they are in such a way that they meet up. Now, if this had been x minus 1, or if this had been you know, x plus two or something like that, then it would not have met up and there would have been that jump discontinuity. The limit would not have existed uh, because the limit from the left and from the right would have been different. Now, that is basically how we take a function, a given function and evaluate it, right? Well, what if we are given something like this where we are actually asked to give a number such that it will be continuous, right? And so I have 3x squared uh, for the values of x that are greater than or equal to 1, and I have ax minus 4, and I need to find the value of a that, that causes it to meet up, okay? And I, I'm going to go ahead and open up a uh, grapher right here, and here is your 3x squared, okay? Now, of course, this over here, okay, this left, right, this side right here uh, from one to the left actually doesn't exist, okay? It's only this piece right here from one to infinity. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for a value of a that will cause ax minus four to meet up, okay? Well, what if it was one x minus four? Well, that doesn't work because you, you, uh, you have the y intercept down here but of course, at x is equal to one, it's down here at negative three. Okay, well, how about at two x? Okay, well, it's, we're getting closer. Uh, not two x isn't gonna work. How about something stupid like five x? Okay, well, now we're actually getting somewhere because you still have that y-intercept of negative four, but now over here at one, we're actually getting up into the positive values and it's not yet meeting up right here at one three, but it's here at 1, 1, and that's closer. Okay, well, let's try 8x minus 4. Okay, well, now we've gone too far, right? Because we wanted to meet up right here at x is equal to 1, but instead they're meeting up right here at about, you know, 2 thirds or roughly 2 thirds. But what we find out is that they meet up perfectly at the order pair 1, 3 in order to make a, uh, to make the, uh, piecewise function, uh, make the pieces of the piecewise function meet up and therefore create a continuous function, those happen when a is equal to 7. Well, I mean, you can sit here and, and search for that kind of thing, graphically speaking, but it's probably better to say, okay, when, at, f, at, at x is equal to 1, this becomes 3, 1 squared. At x is equal to 1, this becomes a, 1 minus 4. Okay, and that should show you very easily. This is three, that's four, so a is equal to seven, and you've done it algebraically. Basically, you said, if, if they're going to meet up, then both of these, if they're gonna meet up at this seam, and this is the only, I don't know if there's an official word for it or not, but basically this is the disjunction between chunks of the domain, right? This is the chunk of the domain that is, you know, one to infinity. And this is the chunk of the domain that goes from negative infinity to one. And right here at x is equal to one, there's sort of a seam, okay? 
Now, in order for them to meet up, then the different pieces are going to have to have the same output at x is equal to 1. And all you have, so all you have to do is plug in 1 to both of them and determine the value that makes that the case. And in this case, it's uh, a is equal to 7. So we have seen that not only uh, graphically, but also analytically as well. So uh, let's go ahead and do another example. Okay, now this is a cubic. Okay, this is a cubic for x is less than or equal to 2 and a quadratic for x uh, is greater than 2. And what we want to do is, and, and some of you are already figuring this out, right? What we want to do is, um, obviously, if we are dealing with the cubic, we can go ahead and graph it. And that's never a bad idea when we have the time. It's always good practice. Uh, now, remember that when you're dealing with this cubic, uh, oh gosh, I can't really scale it like that, can I? Uh, I'm going to have to scale the vertical uh, by ones. And so you have it at 0, 0, you have it at 1, 1, and you have it at 2, 8. Okay, But of course, it's, uh, it's for x is less than or equal to 2. So it actually doesn't exist out here. It only exists uh, you know, as in terms of uh, the actual piecewise function. It only exists here. Now, this one right here, it's ax squared. So you know that it comes right here. Uh, it has its vertex at the origin. The question is, what kind of stretch gets me to here? And then, you know, goes off and actually starts here and gives me a quadratic curve coming up from there. Okay. And the answer is 2, because when I plug in 2 right here, you're going to get 2 cubed and a times 2 squared. Uh, so it's 8 is equal to 4a, or a is equal to 2. Because, you know, basically if this has 3 2s and this has 2 2s, what does this one need in order to meet up and have the same output? Another 2, okay? Um, Let's move on to one that's a little bit more difficult because it has not one, but two different, uh, two different values that need to be found in order to show continuity. Well, let's go ahead and graph the pieces that we can. And they're really easy because they're constant functions. That means they're horizontal lines. Yay, horizontal lines. Uh, we'll go ahead and scale it uh, two boxes to one unit. And at x is less than or equal to negative 1, uh, you have uh, y is equal to, or f of x is equal to 2. At greater than 3, it's going to be negative 2. Okay, so right off the bat, you know uh, right off the bat, you know that what you're looking for is a negative a value and a positive b value. And I know that because if I were to go ahead and draw what is going to, what is going to connect the dots, right? I see a negative slope and I see a positive, I see a positive um, y-intercept. Now, you could actually do it from the graph right here. You could show that it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's a rise of positive 4 and a run of negative 4. So it has a slope of negative 1. So slope of negative 1. And right here, you see the fact that your b looks a whole lot like it's going through 0, 1. But let's go ahead and deal with it analytically. Okay. So we have, let's deal with, uh, this one right here that has the seam at negative 1. Okay, and at negative 1, 2 is just 2. Okay, and so we have a at negative 1 plus b. Now, what we have down here for the seam at, at, at x is equal to 3 is at 3, negative 2 is just negative 2. But we have 3 plus b. And I think you see where this is going. What happens here is I have negative a plus b is equal to 2. 
and 3a plus b is equal to negative 2, I have a system of equations that needs to be solved. And let's go ahead and just multiply that first one through by a negative, do a little bit of um, elimination. Negative 4, so a is equal to negative 1. And if a is equal to negative 1, I can go back into either one of my originals, right, and plug it in. So I know that I have negative a plus b is equal to 2. That's negative negative 1 plus b is equal to 2, or b is equal to 1. And I've used a system of equations to find a and b based upon the output values at the seam of x is equal to negative 1 and the seam in the domain at x is equal to 3. And I've confirmed what I saw graphically. Okay. Now, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of this. I'm going to do the intermediate value theorem and the, and the problems associated, the example problems associated with that in a second video. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, please do shoot me an email. Bye.